Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> this is a meeting of the Board of Health of the City of Northampton. Today is September 19th, 2024. It's 5.34 p.m. Um, we'll start with public comment session. Um, Suzanne, if you could be our timekeeper, are you ready up for that? Uh, sure. And um, I think we had given two minutes or three minutes. What had we done in the past? Two minutes, Joanne, was the last policy that we put in place. Okay. So uh, folks um, <clears throat> who want to speak in public comment, you'll have two minutes and you'll let us know. Um, your videos are probably not um, visible to us. They may not be vi visible to us. So you'll have to um, Tell us that you want to participate by using the reaction button on your Zoom, um, waving your hand or something like that. Um, good, putting your hand up. Um, and I'll call on people one at a time. You'll have two minutes. The board um, will not be um, will not be um, interacting with you, but you'll have two minutes to say what you like. Um, okay, I see two folks with raised hands. Joanne, hand. I just ask that we ask our um, public who are going to provide comment tonight to state their name and perhaps if they have an affiliation with some some business or something that they let us know that as well. Okay. Great. Um, we'll start with uh, Matthew. You can unmute yourself for one second. Oh, there you go. Okay. Hi. Good evening. Thank you, board. Uh, my name is Matthew Porter. I'm the attorney for Racing Mart Fuel Shell uh, Mart, which has a hearing on for this evening. Um, and we were just recently engaged by our attorney this week. So we had reached out to your office this morning just to ask for a possible continuation on that hearing to the following hearing, just so we can have some more time to gather some information. Um, so we had spoken with your office this morning and were informed that the, the only way that we could really do this would be to zoom in um, and during the open comment section request that continuance. So that's the purpose of, of zooming in now. Can I add something here? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I'm sure I, I think there was a little misinformation. You'll have to wait until we open up the public hearing for okay. Racing Mart and then you'll come on and you'll ask for the continuance. Entirely fine. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank yep. you, Matthew. Gina? Hello, um, my name is Christina White and I am a resident of Florence. Um, I'm here today for at, to ask for your help in educating the people of our city about light pollution and the specific steps our citizens can take to reduce light pollution. I am a veterinarian and I've spent my career advocating for animals and their families. I started to research light pollution when my neighbors put brighter, bluer bulbs in their driveway lights, which were shining into my bedroom. They left them on all night. The more I researched, the more I realized that every organism is affected by artificial light at night, also known as Allen. I learned that light glow is far reaching and there is a large body of data showing damage to human, animal, and plant life. Allen has been shown to increase the risk of breast and prostate cancer and increase autoimmune disorders, among other effects in people. It harms pollinators, birds and butterflies and bees by interfering with their navigation and their mating, which affects our food supply locally. It confuses plants so that they do not properly change with seasons. My neighbors with the bright lights were surprised and they were glad that I mentioned the issue and they certainly simply turned the lights off when they weren't using them. It is so easy for all of us to just go inside and not realize that the lights are affecting the world around us. I am pleased that Northampton recently passed a new lighting ordinance which limits future projects, but it doesn't consider cover existing lights. Other communities, for example, Nantucket, did pass an ordinance saying that all lights need to be in compliance within five years. So we need the people in our community to understand the impact of the lights they choose and the times that they have them on. 
with LEDs, lights get brighter and bluer, but not That's better. That's time. Okay. So we, um, another person is going to speak as well, and we just would like to partner with you and to try and educate the public. Thank you. Thank you. Emily? Hi, my name is Emily Ouija. My address is 231 Brookline Street in Cambridge. I have a comment about the nicotine-free generation proposal. Can I clarify, am I supposed to say that now or wait until that agenda item? This is your only um, time to comment right now. Great, thank you. I just wanna, I wanna speak in opposition briefly to, to this proposal for the nicotine-free generation. I resent the fact that paid tobacco control activists are going around the state of Massachusetts pushing for this proposal to restrict the freedom of adults to choose for themselves. There's been a lot of talk at various hearings in Massachusetts about youth and kids, but what this proposal actually means is that you'll be preventing adult choice and drawing a direct line to a complete ban on tobacco and nicotine. I don't think that we in Massachusetts believe that it is really the place of public health to ban things like alcohol, marijuana, unhealthy food, and gambling. These are all choices that we've seen fit to allow adult consumers to make for themselves. If we place a ban on the ability to purchase tobacco and other nicotine-containing products, we're saying it's okay to dictate adult lifestyle choices, and there will be no end to it. I also want to briefly mention right. the negative consequences. I'm going to bring this up. Is that okay? What do you mean? Bring it back. Mr. Patel, could you please mute your... Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to briefly mention the negative consequences that will result, adult and teen smoking rates are at an all-time low, but this will lead to needless increase in black market crime, increased cost of enforcement and policing, and inequitable enforcement, as well as loss of convenience store revenue away from towns that have passed the proposal to other towns and states. So I ask you to please not even consider this proposal at this time and stand up against special interest activists who don't represent Massachusetts citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, E.K. Hello, um, my name is Elaine Kempesi. Um, I have joined the meeting today because of the racing mart that is on the schedule um, selling vapes to my underage son um, and I would like to uh, definitely uh, see that something is done so that they cannot continue this behavior. My son is 17 years old and on four different occasions has bought uh, vapes from that store, flavored vapes that are not legal in the state of mass. And this is unacceptable. I do hope uh, that I can participate in trying to make sure that this doesn't happen and that they are not able to do this any further. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Brennan. Uh, hey, good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is Peter Brennan. I'm the executive director of the New England Convenience Store and Energy Marketers Association. Uh, here to testify Seems like kind of prematurely because there, nobody has testified in support of this, but I'm here to testify in opposition to any um, adoption of a nicotine free generation bylaw. And I do that for a number of reasons. You know, I'm a proud graduate of the UMass system out in Amherst, and uh, I know the Pioneer Valley has a rich history of tobacco production, tobacco farms. I remember growing up as a kid driving by those farms smelling the uh, tobacco leaves drying. And um, I feel like to criminalize nicotine while legalizing pretty much every other vice that we can think of. We, alcohol is legal, marijuana is increasingly legal. We're about to legalize psychedelics in this state. Um, why do we feel the need to make it so that adults cannot purchase nicotine products? I disagree with that. I think that if you want to keep these products out of the hands of the youth, which we all do, then you keep them in our stores, which we scan IDs, we card anybody under 30, and we make sure that youths are not permitted to access any form of nicotine product. Now, again, seems premature. We haven't heard from the proponents yet, but I think this is a foolish policy. I think it's a ridiculous policy. I think it's the worst form of virtue signaling to say that we disagree with all nicotine, 
<clears throat> and we don't think that anybody is ever going to be old enough to make the choice to do it on their own. So I disagree with that, uh, just in case you take it up. I really don't know. I've seen the agenda. It's hard to say at this point. I also disagree that nicotine pouches need to be sold okay. in 21 plus stores. So we think that our stores are the right place to keep nicotine products. We scan IDs, um, we adhere to the law, and I'm open to questions if anybody wants to ask me anything. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here for the public comment session? I don't see any other electronic hands. There are a number of people who I can't, uh, oh, I do see one more. Fat Black Cat 77. You'll have to unmute yourself. Hi. My name is Catherine Moriarty. I sorry, I did not I did not call on you. Hold on. We're uh waiting to hear from Fat Black Cat 77. I think you're ready to go. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, quietly. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Stephen Helfer, and I represent Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights. Uh, we accept uh, no uh, support from the industry. Uh, recently, the CDC uh, released its newest statistics regarding e-cigarette use and uh, tobacco use for youth. Uh, right now, according to the CDC, fewer than 2% of teenagers smoke regular tobacco. Um, electronic cigarette use by teens, again, this is all according to the CDC, is at a 10 year low. According to Gallup, adult smoking is about 11%, which is at an 11%, which is at an 80 year low. And in fact, the CDC further notes uh, that three out of adult people who have ever smoked, two thirds of them have quit. That's a 66% quit rate, which is a remarkably mar high quit rate for a uh, product that is said to be addictive. So given the low smoking rates, both of adults and teenagers, I do not see why Northampton would want to burden its real real retailers uh, with what amounts to a complete prohibition. Many of these retailers, uh, primarily convenience stores, gas station and liquor stores are owned uh, by immigrants of color uh, and every product they sell helps them to survive in a very difficult market. So I think this That's will be high. Can I just finish up with one quick comment? Finish your sentence, yep. On the contrary, or contrasting to that, uh, Massachusetts has a very large tobacco control complex uh, and many, if not most, of its proponents of this NFG have legal degrees. So I think there's a terrible imbalance of power uh, that has class and racial issues involved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Catherine, you can unmute yourself. Hi. My name is Catherine Moriarty. Um, as a breast cancer survivor and someone in long-term rehabilitation for traumatic brain injury, I'm deeply invested in our community's health. My passion for backyard astronomy led me to discover the significant impacts of light pollution, not just on the night sky, but on human health and the environment. Um, research suggests that exposure to artificial light at night disrupts our circadian rhythms and suppresses melatonin production which impacts immune function and increases cancer risk. Additionally, overly bright light and poorly shielded lighting can, can create glare, paradoxically making it harder to see at night and posing safety risks for drivers. 
Our city already has a progressive lighting ordinance, and I believe that through public education and collaboration, we can effectively reduce light pollution and make our community healthier. I would like to request a meeting to discuss how we can work together to promote this cause. I appreciate the board's role in public health advocacy and I'm eager to contribute my efforts. Please let me know how I can actually connect with you. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to participate in public comment? I'm looking for an electronic hand. I don't see anyone else. Thank you all to those who participated. We appreciate your comments. Um, Meredith, did you want to comment? Yeah, I just want to let everybody know who has joined the meeting tonight that there there is not a vote on whether or not we are adapting nicotine free generation or the restriction of nicotine delivery products. It's just a discussion tonight. Um, if the board sees fit and it's something that they'd like to discuss further, we'll have a public forum where we can have a dialogue with the public and then a hearing at a, another date and time, which we would announce. So I just want to let you know you're welcome to stay and listen to the discussion. There won't be any public interaction um, that will be in the future if they decide to move forward. Thank you. Um... Okay, so now we will move on. Uh, just a word that um, I'm um, going to introduce the uh, members of the board who are here tonight. Everyone is in attendance. That's Cynthia Swopis, Suzanne Smith, Janet Grant, Dallas Dukar, and myself, Joanne Levin. Uh, Meredith, would you introduce the staff who's here tonight? Certainly. Um, so tonight we have with us Director of Environmental Health, Amy Hutchins. We have our lead public health regional nurse, Jennifer Brown. We have Kelly Constantine, our department assistant. And I believe the last staff I can see on my one screen is um, our new employee to the DHHS, Kristen Dearborn. Um, Kristen has started with us, I believe in um, July on a part-time basis, remote from Spain, and then moved to Western Massachusetts and started full-time with us um, around the first week of August. So Kristen, we'd like you to uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and maybe share with the board a little bit about how you got to this position and what some of your responsibilities are. Wait, yeah, one, certainly. One oh. second, I just wanna announce that this meeting is being recorded. I don't think we said that already. Um, we have not officially opened our board meeting yet. Oh, uh, would yes. Someone like, would someone like to make a motion? Would you open the meeting? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Okay. The board meeting is officially open. It's 5.53 p.m. Um, go for it. Thank you, Meredith. Um, good evening. I am the new Shared Services Coordinator, as Meredith has shared, for the Hampshire Public Health Shared Services Collaboration. Um, it's so nice to officially meet you all. I know many of you know already that our collaborative serves 14 municipalities, including the city of Northampton, which hosts the Public Health Excellence Grant that we are funded by. And we offer essential public health services like vaccine clinics, which we're currently in the midst of planning in all of our communities, food inspections, informational presentations, and so much more. Um, we offer those to our partners with the goal of expanding health equity in all of our municipalities, big and small. And um, yes, I started working full-time in August, and I began my journey in the field of public health back in 2016. So my previous experience includes working in health promotion, educational programming, infectious disease mitigation, and other population-based health initiatives in both Connecticut and Colorado. And I was previously in Spain uh, prior to moving to Massachusetts. And I'm very excited to be part of such an innovative organization here at DHHS. And I'm really looking forward to developing my role as the regional coordinator. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Joanne, I there minor oversight. I also see Inspector Donna Bowman with us tonight. Sorry about that, Donna. And I believe Substance Use Prevention Director Taylor McAndrew is with us as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge other DHHS employees that are on our Zoom Board Health meeting with us tonight. Great, thank and you. I, I also just say one more thing. Um, because we do have the tobacco hearing scheduled for six, um, I don't want to have to cut off Jen Brown short. If everybody is present for the tobacco hearing, um, we we go out of order. And maybe okay. Mr. Porter can answer that for us if his client and himself are present and we take them now and open up the um, tobacco hearing. Jen, can you stick around? I can. Excellent. Thank you. Let me just um, get out some materials here. Um, so we have five minutes. Uh, is everyone here and ready to go? Who's here for the uh, hearing? Mr. Porter, is your client here? Uh, yes, Prakash Patel. Okay. Donna, do we need anybody else? We're good on our end. Okay. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so would someone like to make a motion to open the hearing for violations of the city of Northampton Board of Health restricting the sales of tobacco products and electronic nicotine delivery systems regulation and the state of Massachusetts minimum standards for retail sale of tobacco and electronic nicotine delivery systems, which is 105 CMR 665. Would anyone like to uh, make a motion to open the hearing? To open. open the hearing. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, uh, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? I guess I have a question if we do formally open it or take the request first from Matthew Porter. Does he do that after we've opened it? Is that? I think that's the. And yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Okay. All in favor of opening the hearing? <clears throat> okay. Um, one second. Um, so that hearing is officially open at 5 57 p.m. on Thursday, September 19th. I just want to go over some ground rules for this hearing. Um, in order to speak, you need to be recognized by the chair, who is me. Um, and hearing testimony, testimony should only be related to the issue at hand. Evidence may consist of oral testimony, documents, photographs, videos, models, or other means of conveying information. Um, time will be somewhat limited. Only evidence re uh, relevant to the issues before the board will be accepted. Irrelevant, immaterial, and information based on speculation and emotion are not appropriate evidence upon which to base a decision. The rules of evidence that apply in court do not apply to these public hearings of local boards, committees, or commissions. As such, hearsay and other evidence that would not be per permitted in a court of law may be heard by the board, committee, or commission, um, and accord such weight as each member deems appropriate. Um, I have read the notice of the hearing and um, ask all who wish to speak to sign in. So we don't obviously have a sign in that you can do. Um, so if you are, would like to speak at the hearing, could you please raise your electronic hand? Uh, is EK part of this hearing? I believe EK provided public comment, um, the mother of right. the son who purchased. Right. Is she part of this hearing? No. Mm -mm. 
Okay. Um, and is Mr. Patel part of this hearing? You can, can you raise your electronic hand? Do you know how to do that under reactions? Under reaction. Okay, well, we know you're here. Okay. Um, okay, we know to call on you. Um, so we'll start with representatives from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and then the board members may ask questions when recognized by the chair. And then we will hear from uh, Mr. Porter and Mr. Patel uh, to testify. Well, I do you mind if I make a recommendation? Yeah. Since we already know what Matthew Porter's request is, could we hear him first? And then um, if the board would like to either continue with the hearing, then we can provide testimony, or if the board would like to continue, we'll just schedule for another time. I'm just wondering if the board would want to know some information before making that decision. Um, I think that seems appropriate for them to have some information before hearing Mr. Porter. Can we do that? So let's start with um, Donna Bowman. Yes, good evening. Um, uh, reason for, I'm sorry. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, the reason we're here tonight is for hearing uh, uh, regarding Racing Mart uh, um, selling flavored uh, products. Uh, and the reason we, uh, we, we, we conducted an inspection uh, on 813 uh, from a, a complaint we received uh, from a uh, Northampton resident uh, of uh, e -play uh, flavored e-cigarettes being sold to their youth. Um, that triggered uh, an inspection uh, uh, at the establishment uh, when we were, when we arrived on scene. It was myself and my coworker Kristen Hargreaves Modio. Uh, I'm sorry, I strike that. It was actually JJ Pusak. Uh, we we found that uh, the establishment was uh, selling uh, blunt wraps, uh, flavored blunt wraps, uh, uh, flavored enhancers, and also had a backpack full of. Of, of, of flavored e-cigarettes behind the counter. Uh, at the time, um, it, it would have been the fourth um, violation of our uh, local regulation. Um, it was a, uh, we sent a letter out um, to the establishment to let them know that their uh, permit, tobacco permit, was suspended until the hearing. Um, in the meantime, we uh, conducted follow-up visit uh, and found uh, a crate full of flavored e-cigarettes on the counter for sale. Um, we had a Zoom meeting with the owner um, on the same day, just to let him know uh, the findings um, and we got to today. Thank you. Um... Is there anyone else from the DHS who uh, has information that we need? Um, so what was the date that you um, informed them that their tobacco permit was suspended? There was a letter sent out on eight, uh, eight, uh, eight, 28, and it was August 28th. Okay. Um, and that letter said their tobacco permit was suspended and they needed to take everything off the shelf? That is correct. Okay. And when you went back um, for your follow-up visit, that had not happened? Uh, the, most things were re removed from the shelf behind the counter, um, but we did find the crate full of the flavored e-cigarettes on, on the side counter. Do you know the date of that follow-up? Yes. That was uh, nine five. Okay. September fifth. Okay. Um, Mr. Porter or um, or when can client, I? 
Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, just for Donna. Donna, you mentioned um, this was the fourth violation. Correct. And and so uh, can you just, when, when did the other violations occur? The other violations occurred, uh, the first one was on January 3rd of 2023. Uh, and it was for various violations, uh, but they were only uh, fined for one. Um, the second violation uh, was was on 8-14-23. Uh, 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 and those were the second and third fine violations. So this is uh, today, uh, this latest one would be the fourth. And, and Donna, you mentioned a backpack. Could I just um, understand what's going on with this backpack? <laughs> yes, um, the clerk that was on, on duty that day had a backpack um, on, on the back of the counter. Um, and when we asked, uh, you know, we asked what was in there. He said there were uh, cigarettes and, and e-cigarettes e that were his own private stock. Um, we asked him if he, we could see what was in there. He just zipped it open real quick and uh, we saw what was in there and he just closed it up. Uh, we asked him to remove them from the store uh, and he he took them outside and put them on the bench in front of the store. The, this crate that was there behind the counter, mm -hmm. when, when we inquired about that crate, mm -hmm. um, what was the response? There was no response. Okay. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. Any other uh, members of the board have any questions? You'll be able, you'll have time to ask more questions in a little bit if you like. Um, Mr. Patel, do you want to speak or do you want um, Matthew Porter to speak? Matthew Porter will speak for me. Matt? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so um, Matthew Porter for uh, from VR and DJ Flippo uh, representing Racing Bars. So we were engaged uh, just this past week on this matter. Um, we received a letter today. We were able to review it, but we haven't had an opportunity to go through the prior violations uh, or the, the town statute. So respectively, I, I would just request um, that if the board were open to it, just continuing to the following hearing, just to allow us uh, more time to, to prepare and review um, the violations um, all of that being said, the product has been cleared um, definitively um, from the store. Um, and obviously that would continue to be the case until uh, the continuance should the board uh, decide to grant that. Okay. Um, members of the board, any comments or questions? Just precedent and historical. Have we continued? We've continued hearings before, haven't we, Meredith? I think. Um, you know, we have continued hearings when we were considering amending regulations. I don't think we've considered one for a violation. I don't think there's precedence for that um, in my time. I guess my my immediate concern about continuance is that where the business is still operating. I know Matthew told us the products have been removed, but it appears we have a history of backpacks and crates, et cetera. Um, so I just feel a little uncomfortable because we don't know when the next hearing would be um, and a period of time where, where we still haven't made a decision. But I, I yield to my colleagues on the board. What your th other thoughts about this? Joanne? Uh, yes. I'm sorry, my hand's not working. This one's working, but not on the Zoom. Um, I appreciate Cynthia's questions and the perspective that that puts on this. I guess my hesitation with moving forward at this meeting when there's been a request is that the current um, level of, of infraction is one that would qualify for a permanent discontinuance which of a license, which is a very uh, substantial consequence. So it's because of that, that uh, I think some consideration should be made to honor the wish of um, allowing the owner of this business to have interaction with his attorney who can be fully informed on the history 
and the present violation. Any other comments? Um, Meredith, a little guidance about how to proceed. Um, according to the guidelines, um, we have to close the hearing in order to make a motion or decision is either to uphold the violation, dismiss the violation, or table and schedule another hearing. Um, so right, we'll, we'll close the evidence section and motion to begin the yes, close the evidentiary portion of the hearing, and then um, the board will have a vote on what to do. If I may, just quickly, so I, if it moves forward to a vote either to continue it or to to state that there was a violation or not a violation. Um, is it possible to vote on the continuance to begin with? Because if the if it wasn't continued, then obviously we want to we would want to move forward with the hearing tonight. So I, I just wouldn't want that to be the three options, if that makes sense. Carl, do you have any recommendations for us? Um, I, I would have voted on the continuance before even opening the mm -hmm. hearing, um, but I think you can do that now. You can vote on whether to grant the continuance and then table it um, because I believe the alleged violator has a right to present um, his case and his counsel has made it clear that they need, that the counsel would like to look at the entire file, not just the facts of this case to determine the other violations as well as what's before the board right now. So I would, although I don't represent the city at all, I only provide legal education and technical assistance. If if I were the board, I would vote on whether to grant the continuance right now. Thank you. <clears throat> Cynthia? But just uh, uh, pursuing on this path, a um, question for Matthew. You, you indicated that products have been removed or products are no longer being so I just wanted clarification on on um, what you were referring to earlier uh, so there are no tobacco products in the store and no backpacks either so everything okay. has been cleared entirely from the store and I think Mr. Patel has a yep yeah. mm -hmm. yes <clears throat> sorry so yes that particular employee who has a you know backpack and the carriers they're both gone so there is no tobacco. The day that we had a Zoom meeting the last time, the emergency Zoom meeting week, I personally went there, took all the tobacco out, brought it back, put them in the storage. And so there's no tobacco, no backpack, no carrots. Anyone that employee is gone as well because he was the one not supposed to do it, but he did it. So he's gone as well. So there's nothing in the store whatsoever. Not even one single nicotine package right now. So no I electronic think... cigarettes or nope. anything? Nothing, nothing, nothing. You can go anytime. You can check out mm -hmm. the whole entire store and you will not find one cigarette pack in there. So. so I think it would be our um, assumption or understanding that between now and the time that a hearing if, if was continued uh, until the next date, um, that during that entire period of time, there would be no nicotine or or um, nicotine products in the store. Nothing. Nothing. Correct. Yeah, and and they're not permiss. It's not permissible under your statute either. So no, there would be none. Meredith, can I if the, can I make a recommendation? If the board were to continue, I would like to see multiple signs on the front door at the point of sale saying per board of health due to violations of sales of sure. whatever we're no longer allowed to sell and i mean i feel like the public has a right to know why they're not selling instead of we just don't have tobacco products at this time um sure. they're historical offenders and um you know after they were asked to remove all products from the store were secretively selling products. And it's not the first time, second time, or third time that they've been doing this. So sure. I want it big and bold if we continue. I will do that. 
Any other questions or comments? Um, I, I have a comment. Um, I'm just wondering, and you know, part of this is just wondering about protocol, but um, is there some kind of way to determine fairly what gives um, attorney Porter enough time to review everything and still keeps this timely and moving forward and not saying, okay, we, you know, we need four months to review it or something like that, that, um, that we come up, do we come up now with a date for if, for a continuance for a hearing and that everybody can agree to? Yeah, we, we would be happy to do that. How often does the board meet? We regularly? meet once, once a month and our next meeting would be October 17th. Yeah, the seventeenth is perfectly fine. That gives us enough time. Would someone like to make a motion, Mr. Patel? Let me, before we close, Mr. Patel, have you said everything um, that you would like to say? Yes. For the moment. Okay. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Uh, not a motion. Second. Question. Just one final question, if I could. Sorry, Joanne. Um, this is this has nothing to do with our purview, but I just wanted to establish for myself: is uh, liquor being sold at this particular establishment? Beer and wine, yes. Thank you. Would someone like to make a motion? You're muted, Suzanne. Move to suspend this hearing until our next board meeting in October. The table and schedule reschedule for October 17th. Yes. Um, is there a second? Second. Cynthia, second. Uh, any discussion? All right, the motion stands. All in favor? Uh, Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. You're Thank very you. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good night, guys. Would someone like to make a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close hearing. Is there a second. second? All in favor? I mean, is there any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Cynthia? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all. All right. Um, okay, back to our agenda. Uh, Jen, you still here? Hi, everybody. Go for it. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Great. I have one slide. And let's see. Are you able to see that one slide? Not yet. Oh no. Okay. I hope Sometimes I can it takes do. A second. Sometimes it takes a second. Mm, does anybody see anything? It says you're screen sharing, but I don't see it. I think you have to double you have to double click. Well, I have to double click, but each of us have to double click. No, 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 no. Uh Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I'm gonna try it again. Go ahead. No worries. I'm going to try another s screen. Now Is double that... click. Yeah, now double click. Double click. Yeah. There, there we go. go. You can see it. Okay. I hope I can exit when it's time. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Everyone, I'm Jennifer Brown. I'm one of the public health nurses here um, at the DHHS um, Division of <laughs> Health Nursing, and I'm a regional nurse. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about the respiratory disease season we're coming up against and vaccine efforts. So this is one slide I wanna review. What I put together is some graphics. The top part is 
um, about some data that's going on locally, regionally, and then nationally. And then the bottom part is uh, about vaccines and our efforts. So the upper left-hand corner is the sample wastewater. Um, it came in today, and it's from a sample that was taken on September 11th. And this is a year's um, worth of um, copies. It's called from BioBot. Um, if you want to see that, you can go to the DHHS website and you can look at that. You can also go to the Department of Public Health website and look at this as well. So with wastewater, as we know, the best indicator um, is one of our best public health key, um, indicators for um, the spread of COVID. It's not precise. Um, wastewater provides an early warning about two weeks of increasing case levels in the community. And I know we know this, but I'll say it again, it's not a precise indicator. Um, right now, that top part where we are now is saying 3 million copies. That doesn't correlate with 3 million people or cases, that's just how Biobot describes it. But if you look at that, the previous one this summer, that was our small surge, that was 3.3. So it's the second highest peak we've had this year. The 3.5 that we see over on the left is from December. Um, I wanted to go to the little oval in the middle. That is the national wastewater average. So that came from the CDC just a few hours ago. I put that in there. Um, two weeks ago, it was very high. Now it's high, so it's beginning to trend down. They think, some of the experts think we reached a peak and things are beginning to decline. But I think we all can agree that coming up, um, we're going to see an increase as people come together, um, they're inside with um, uh, less air circulation and more um, functions that bring us together, um, holidays coming up. Um, looking at the top um, tier there, the Massachusetts COVID data, that's also from the dashboard today from the Department of Public Health. You can see that the COVID cases peaked in August and they're beginning to come down a little bit. And that last one, September 4th, it took a little dip down. On the right is COVID deaths. They didn't decline as much as cases did. That stayed up a little bit higher. Um, so that's been a slower trend coming down. What I wanted to go to now is the bottom tier and our vaccination efforts. So the bottom left is the 2023-24 COVID flu vaccine status that um, DHHS um, gave last year. So from September to January 1st. In Northampton, we gave 1,507 vaccines at 13 sites. And as a regional, um, uh, the PHE um, regional partners, including Northampton, um, the 14 towns, we gave 2,826 vaccines at 34 um, sites. So I always like to give a shout out when I can. Last time I was spoke to you, I thank wastewater DPW people who are getting those samples. I want to say a special thank you to all the volunteers that helped us put this program together. 21 volunteers come out and help support vaccinate the team. I mean, the, the, the residents. So we have great vaccinators. We're really proud of the work they do. We think they deliver a really good product. Um, and it's a vaccine, but it's also education and support. Um, we did training um, last week. We were really happy to see everyone to come together. And we started talking about what's new this season. I'm going to jump to the lower right hand corner. That's just a little plug about the vaccines that we're going to be offering for the COVID vaccines. We're going to be offering Pfizer for 18 and older and then Moderna and Pfizer for the younger um, uh, residents, six months to 17 years old. And the CDC has um, come out with new guidance just last month. So we've been waiting for that. So it's really good to see what they're recommending this year for Moderna. For example, six months through four years old, um, they want you to have two doses of the same series. So for those mm -hmm. children that had a Moderna dose when they were three and they want to come back, um, we have Moderna so you can complete the series. We also have Pfizer. Um, with uh, 
that um, <clears throat> vaccine, I think I said it before, but it is very exciting. It comes in a pre-filled syringe. And so I know you vaccinators out there remember three years ago, four years ago when Pfizer came, it was ultra cold. It was a teeny little vial. We had to reconstitute it. It was very hard to keep that cold chain. Pfizer um, now comes pre-filled syringe. We put it into the refrigerator and it's there for eight months until it expires. Keeping that cold chain is really, really an important thing as we all know. This does make it easier to administer. The flu vaccine, the bottom right, um, we have high dose and regular dose. We are getting it from Sanofi Pasteur and it is trivalent this year. Um, it used to be quadrivalent and it's just covering three of the strains um, that are circulating. Two years ago, the CDC said 65 older, we recommend that high dose. Before it was always up to you with a strong recommendation from a practitioner. The high dose has four times the antigen level and is supposed to give a more robust um, response to the um, illness in people who may have trouble mounting that response. The middle bar to the right, sorry, I had fun putting these slides around in different orders. I mean, these, these um, little uh, uh, snippets from DPH. From last year, the vaccina vaccination rate against COVID was 21%. That's in Massachusetts. The vaccination against the influenza, um, using the influenza vaccine last year in Massachusetts was 42%. So we are really thinking about what we're gonna do this year here in Northampton. So with the upcoming season, and that's the bottom uh, slide or bit there, we're thinking about what we're gonna be doing. We're just starting our vaccine um, clinics. We started two days ago. Here in Northampton, we're gonna be, we have 14 sites scheduled already. So those are some departments in the city. We're also going out to the housing authority um, and um, senior center, municipal um, clinics. Um, we always look forward to all of these. For our regional partners, we have 18 sites that we have scheduled so far. Some of those sites are filling up and we're thinking maybe we'll just uh, add a second site um, later in the season. Um, we welcome some new communities to um, the people, the towns that we're vaccinating. And then just the last thing, we're really thinking about how we can have more targeted clinics and outreach. Um, homebound, was that, do we, it's not opening it up, but it used to be we really wanted to restrict it to people that maybe were restricted to their house. But now homebound may mean more than that. Who has access, um, trouble accessing vaccine? We can come to you. We want to do wraparound. Are there home care providers that we can do? Children in the house, multi-generational houses. Can we come and vaccinate everybody in your home? And that's what I have to offer about um, respiratory season. Thank Any questions? Another okay. question. Comments? Go ahead, Janet. Um, just the um, the percentages of vaccination from 2023. Mm -hmm. Is that just reported to the state through these kinds of clinics, or is that also CVS and Walgreens and whoever else is giving vaccine? I'm so sorry. Did you hear me? I did not hear you. Am oh. I still sharing my screen? My power cut You're out. You're not, but that's language. okay. You that don't was good. You need to. No, I uh, wanted to end. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My question was simply the um, statistics on the state rates in 2023 for COVID and influenza of 22 and 41%. Is that only given through public sites, clinics like ours, or is it, does that include the CVSs and the Walgreens and doctor's offices and everybody else who might give vaccine? That's across the board, but I'm going to tell you specifically, I'm not quite sure how they capture that. One thing that I've noticed is um, 
that when you we put our vaccine um, data into two databases, it goes into color, which is our scheduling platform that gets transferred to the MIIS, the Massachusetts Immunization uh, Registry. People can opt to say that they don't want their name registered. So I'm just not quite sure exactly what that captures. There certainly are people that are residents, uh, maybe students who get vaccinated in other um, uh, states so it is across the board but it but somebody like cvs or something like they don't that's where i've gotten mine they don't ask me if i want it reported or not but so i assume they will just report yes they that okay. they should it's part of the registry we really as a state okay. promote it you know i have to tell you i got my vaccine saturday night in greenfield at 5 15 p.m so the the act the points of access is much greater this year but when i did my little online you know i'm here they asked me do you want to be in the registry so i hope everyone's clicking clicking yes i just want to clarify what it said on your slide is those were the percentages of people who got vaccinated that season. It's not all any COVID vaccine. It was that season's That vaccine. season. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so that numbers are surprisingly oh. low, but it was just for that year's vaccine. Thank you, yes. But for the whole year, the whole year. When they say the season, I think there is a specific September yeah. uh, respiratory season. Um, but I'm not sure, Janet, yeah. And I know earlier in COVID, when people got vaccines at CVS, there was some problem with them getting reported into the MIIS, um, but hopefully that's fixed. But, and Jen, um, uh, yeah, maybe Joanna Meredith, no, um, back in the height of COVID, we, I think I saw percentages of Northampton residents or Northampton residents over 65 that were vaccinated. Are, do we still have those kind of data points uh, going forward? We do have them and they're a, a click away. I don't have them at my fingertips, but that's reported. Yep. All that data is there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to acknowledge, as I understood that data, um, more than half of the immunizations that were delivered in 2023 were delivered through Northampton sites. More than half of the regional total. That's how I understood what was on that slide. I just wanted to, once again, congratulate the leadership of the health department for um, being out there in front on programs like this, um, it, it happens over and over again. And, and I don't want to take for granted that that takes a lot of work and congratulations on what you continue to do. Th thank you very much. It really, it starts at the top and it, it goes down. You know, it's, it's a great vision and we have the support to make it happen. And it's, Public health, a lot of the things are off on the horizon, and this is feels so good to give a shot and just feel like you're really protecting somebody and the community. Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments for Jen? Great. Thanks so much, Jen. All right. Thank you. All right. We will move on. Where are we? Um, Okay, I don't know if everyone knows Cheryl. Um, we're gonna talk about the new model regulations for restricting the sale of tobacco and vape products. Um, we've talked a little bit about this last time. Um, Cheryl, for, for those who don't know you, would you do a brief introduction of yourself and we can go around and introduce ourselves? Sure. Um, I am Cheryl Sabara. I am the Senior Staff Attorney and Executive Director for the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards. We are a membership association and we provide technical assistance and legal education to the 351 local boards of health in Massachusetts. I have been in this role for the past 24 years. I've been involved in public health law for the past 30 years. 
So that is my background. Um, I have been before this board many times, um, and I'm happy to be before you once again. Um, you've asked me to discuss our current model regulations, model tobacco sales regulations, which I must admit we update as needed. And we found a need within the last couple of days to just update a couple other small things in them that, that we can go through tonight. Um, but I think before we start, because I know there are people um, in this audience on this Zoom um, that have mentioned a few things, and, and I, I just want to respond very briefly to two of them. Um, there was a, 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 a statement that, you know, this is an adult choice. Um, using tobacco is an adult choice, especially combustible tobacco. And I would, it, much like, you know, alcohol, cannabis, and other ad adult products, I, I would only want to say that tobacco, especially combustible tobacco, but tobacco is the only consumer product that when used as directive kills you. Um, this is close to my heart. My husband is 74 year years old and has been smoking forever. If you ask him whether it's a choice, he will say, no, it's an addiction. I can't stop smoking. I've tried and he has, and he stopped at one point for 20 years and then he went back to it. I would also, another um, speaker made um, the, his his thought was that those of us that are attorneys, that are public health lawyers, are somehow discriminating um, against people of color. And I would just refer anyone who's interested in really looking at who's doing the discrimination here. I would um, point you in the direction of the tobacco industry do documents that were all made public um, as a result of lawsuits brought by the attorneys general against the tobacco industry to try to recoup Medicare and Medicare expenses um, that were that were incurred because of tobacco related illnesses and deaths. And, and, and the, the website is um, industrydocuments.uscf.edu slash tobacco slash. It's from the University of California. San Francisco. And one of the quotes you can find on this website is one from the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company executive, one of the executives. And he said, um, and I'm not going to swear um, at this meeting, but he said, we don't smoke this, and this is in quotes, we don't smoke this SHIT. We just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid, end quote. Um, there are many um, quotes that you can find on this website throughout if, if you want to really look at tobacco industry documents. So having said that, you know um, I am a tobacco control activist, um, and I believe strongly in tobacco control measures. However, when I look at tobacco control measures, um, I look at them comprehensively. Um, there are a lot of evidence-based policies that Northamp Northampton has already enacted, um, banning flavor, limiting flavored tobacco products, um, banning smoking in general, capping permits, looking at density issues. Um, you've done a lot of really comprehensive work that is evidence-based that we can show positive outcomes and measurable outcomes when we look at, when the EPIs actually look at this and, and look at what these policies have actually produced when you're looking at reducing youth smoking. Um, also cessation efforts are incredibly important, especially if you're looking at a policy like the nicotine free generation. What that policy does, and it's in, it's, it's one of, as you know, the way we do our sales templates, the way I and my colleagues who also provide TA to cities and towns on public health issues, in this case, tobacco control issues, we have a checklist and then we have some options for boards of health and it's totally up to the boards of health as to what you um, might wanna consider 
in your policy. And we have added um, the nicotine free generation to this sales template in section D, which says no tobacco sales to persons under 21 or born on or after January 1st, 2004. So, you know, you, you can decide which is the way um, the board wants to address this, either keep it the way it is or move toward tobacco-free generation. And obviously what the tobacco-free generation does is it limits people, not adults, but people that aren't adults from ever purchasing tobacco in that municipality. Um, the One of the things that I personally um, am a little concerned about is what it does to the adult smokers, the, the people like my husband that are addicted, that um, are, are left behind in this policy. That's a concern I have, which is why I feel this policy really has to be enacted with strong cessation resources for those people that will not derive a benefit from this policy. However, if you have done the work that Northampton has done in enacting these policies that make it harder for smokers to smoke, which is exactly what my husband loves, um, that takes all of these flavored products out of stores, that limits the number of tobacco sales permits you can have. You do the enforcement so that you're not, and you clearly intend and have frequently done very strong enforcement. In fact, you don't even have a tolling period. So anyone who's sold three times, it doesn't matter when it was, you know, they get fined and they get suspended. And if they do it four times, it gets revoked. So, and it doesn't matter how long of a period it even is. So you have one, some of the strongest tobacco control policies in the nation in Northampton. And as a result, a, a town like Northampton, considering a nicotine free generation, is, in my opinion, perfectly appropriate because you've done the evidence based policies. This policy is um, is another it, it, it's a long term generational policy to really get in the way and, and to really encourage the social norm of tobacco is a product that kills. If we had lead paint in stores right now, people would be saying, get it out immediately. So we've got this product that is very dangerous and we know it kills people, yet we haven't gotten it out of the stores. It's unlike any other dangerous consumer product because of the position that it's held in our history, in our society, and as someone said earlier, in, in some of our farming. So the fact where Northampton is in the tobacco control, uh, um, in, the, in the timeline and in what you have done, this, in my opinion, would be a, a, a policy that you might want to consider, even with some of, you know, the fact that it's going to be hard to measure. It's going to take a long time to measure. It's it's certainly within your legal authority to consider. Um, the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court, has upheld this policy. It's interesting because this policy did not start at by me or any of the public health law activists, as someone liked to call us. This came from the Brookline town meeting. It wasn't even a board of health regulation. It was a town meeting warrant article that was presented to the town meeting in Brookline. And, and, and a lot of the people that are actually really, um, really married to this policy are not are individuals that are not paid by anyone that don't have grants from the Department of Public Health. In fact, the Department of Public Health looks at this policy as one policy, and they prioritize other policies before it. And then, if those other policies are in existence, this is a really um, positive way to really address. I mean, the fact the fact that if if 
I live in a town that passed this policy. The fact that my four-year-old and six-year-old grandson can't purchase tobacco ever in my town, or quite frankly in theirs, because their town passed it too, makes me really happy. Um, and, and I think most people would really like to see the end of tobacco use. And this policy, although it will take a long time, um, is geared toward getting to that end. It just will take a long time to get there, but that doesn't mean it's a bad policy, just because it will take a, a long time. So that's what I have to say about the policy. Um, we can go through some there aren't a lot of changes in the new draft. There is one. Um, consider you you so you did your draft in 2013, so there aren't many changes. But one is the addition of oral nicotine pouches. Um, we have heard through members in the field that are doing this enforcement on a daily basis that the increase in the amount of Zin-like products that are out there has been phenomenal. We've heard it from schools. We've heard it from our programs. We've heard it from folks that work with youth. And we've seen it in um, other industry documents. Um, Philip Morris is now, oh, Altria, excuse me, um, is looking, they're doing a lot of research and they're doing a lot of purchasing of these kinds of products and they're beginning to manufacture a lot of them. And it's a product, you probably know this or many of you do, that it's a product that you can put between your gum and your um, whatever. <laughs> you can put it in your mouth and suck on it and it and it will eventually you will just swallow it um so you don't have to spit it out or anything and it has um an alarming it has a lot of nicotine in it and it's very popular and we were asked by our field the board of health health programs that do this every day you know what can we do um about this product we're concerned about it we're seeing it everywhere um, again, we don't have a lot of really, we don't have a lot of epi research on just how dangerous it is. We have anecdotal stories and we have a lot of them, but we don't have, which is frequently the case in public health initiatives, um, the, the, the science follows if we wait for the science, we've waited too long um, in many cases when we're looking at public health protection. So we have put into this sample, and again, it's a sample template, which you can adopt or not adopt and do what you want, but we've added a definition of these products, and we have added a section that would Restri restrict the sale of these products to adult only retail tobacco stores. So at least they couldn't be um, seen or purchased by anyone under 21 because they wouldn't be in those stores. So that that's one addition. And then the other, as you know, um, large addition is the addition of the nicotine free generation. Um, and I think those are the others are technical things that 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 we can discuss um at any time but they're not they're not substantive they're not um they they wouldn't add a new strategy to the regulation they would just clean up some language that we think is is more streamlined now so i don't know if you have any questions if i've talked too long which i usually do um meredith why am I calling on you? <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> um, that was wonderful. Thank you. I just wanted to add on to let you know that um, I provided the Board of Health with a merge of our 2023 regulation, which we passed and was uh, effective, I think, April 2023 with the new model regulations. Um, uh, Kristen Dearborn and, and Kelly worked on that. Great. Creating document and the restriction of the nicotine delivery devices, which are the nicotine pouches that Cheryl's referring to. And I'm sure there's things down the road that will fall under that as well, um, fall under section G and it's been highlighted. So you can see clearly where that is. And there's language about NFG in there as well. And, you know, I just, I want to add 
um, you know, one of our, uh, our, our, the public that commented today that was in opposition of this made a statement that they said, you know, um, the percentage of adults who smoke have gone down significantly. And I agree with that. Like we actually have a campaign out here right now that, oh, yeah. you know, we have on buses that in 1993, and I don't, don't um, quote me on this. I think it was like 22% of adults in Massachusetts smoked. And in 2022, it's down to about 10%. And yay, congratulations. But that has to do with really good policy and right. enforcement. So, um, you know, it's taxation, it's doing youth compliance checks, it's not because people just wanted to quit, it's, there's a whole myriad of reasons why those rates have gone down significantly. But conversely, what we have seen, that was only talking about, com you know, combustible cigarettes, our vape has gone up, right? Uh, that's what we've been watching. That's what youth want to use is the vape products. Um, and because access to vape has ended after the um, the passing of um, the acts relative to tobacco 665 and all the flavor restrictions in Massachusetts, which is an amazing feat of the state of Massachusetts to do that, um, we saw you know a surge in youth use in vape, and then the decline because of that great law. But big tobacco, you know, tobacco is always one step ahead of us. And I feel like we fight this battle every year and a half to two years we, where we have to amend our regulation. I think the end goal and people, you know, people ask, what is the end goal that we get to be tobacco free? You know, not just here in Mass, you know, in, in uh, Northampton, but the state of Massachusetts. I, you know, have the honor of being a coordinator for 47 communities here in Western Mass and three counties that they all have very similar feelings, but they're waiting for the first. And always, usually in Western Mass, the first ends up being um, the city of Northampton. We are progressive, we are innovative, and we are uh, champions in public health. Um, so there are many other communities that are waiting for us to kind of take that first step to follow suit. And now that we have, as Kristen Dearborn said so eloquently earlier on tonight, we're part of the shared service agreement, 14 communities together want to make, you know, decisions that are pretty in sync with each other or succinct with each other. Like it, it's easy to make this um, happen at a faster rate than when we did like minimum legal seal, sales age of 21, where it was very kind of piecemeal throughout the state until there was enough of us communities in Massachusetts that had passed that and then the state took it on. So I think this has the opportunity to become, to grow a lot quicker than other um, strategies in the past. And I just want to add, I know I talk really quickly because I have a lot to say and I know the board has a lot to say. Um, we have youth data that um, we can present at a future meeting as well. I, I unfortunately had such a busy day, I wasn't able to digest it well. But when I did look at the NPA, uh, excuse me, the um, SPIFI administers the PNAS, which is the needs assessment survey to 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in the schools. They did it in 2022. They're one of the pieces that I took out of there, and I think we had a presentation on it about a year ago. I'm not, I'm not positive. I still have a little bit of COVID brain. Um, one in five 12th graders reported vaping nicotine in the past 30 days. And also out of the PNA. PNAS data, um, it said access to these products is easier in Northampton when we compare it to like Hampshire County in the state. So I'm just putting that out there and I'm going to invite Spiffy to come in to really do a, um, a digestible uh, um, presentation <clears throat> on the PNA, the, la the latest PNAS survey. Um, so we have that at our fingertips as well. And, and I would just like to add um, a couple of other strategies that you might want to consider. Um, and one would be to limit the sales of all tobacco products to adult only retail tobacco stores or to just ban the sale of tobacco. I mean, those are other strategies that um, are quicker than NFG um, that that can be considered that you have the legal authority to do. 
whether you have the will to do it or not is another thing, but you do have the legal authority to. I've brought this up in uh, the past and uh, a ban of the sale of tobacco, um, would we be the first in the state? Um, yes, to pass a, there are some municipalities that, well, there's one municipality that bans the sale of tobacco, but they have no tobacco retail stores. So it sort of, it just happened. It wasn't, it wasn't intentional. Um, but yes, you would be the first. And has that gone to court? Has that been challenged? No, because there are no retail stores. So no one's challenged it. So the, the way around that is permits, right? Limiting. Right. You would do it through per permits. Yeah. So as we've discussed in the past, you know, new permits. Being well, yeah, you don't new have new, you permanently retire permits. So eventually, yeah. and again, it's a long-term generational strategy because you clearly, if, if a retailer sells a store, you're not going to take away the permit, um, but you're going to permanently retire them as the stores, um, as the permits get returned. Has any and other then, municipality um, limited all tobacco sales to adult tobacco? No, sales? no. I'm just suggesting these if we're looking at cutting ed edge policies that would have a quicker impact than nicotine free generation, then that's um, an option. Suzanne? Uh, Cheryl, um, I'm no expert in this, but reading between the lines of the Supreme Judicial Court's ruling, it seemed that um, the fact that Massachusetts already allowed age restrictions in the sale was part of the reason that they ruled that the um, tobacco-free generation would pass muster. That seems to me to be a different type of ruling than might be required if we banned cigarette or tobacco sales. Oh, we would. You would certainly get sued on well, it. Oh, thank you. I'll. <laughs> they're not going to sit back and watch that happen. No, I'm just saying. I think if you got sued, you'd win. But it. it that's. That's. I'm sure. Um, my brother counsel that's here, um, still here, would disagree with me vehemently on that. But it is a strategy. But that was part of the ruling, correct? It had yes. to do with. With it fit within existing age restrictions. Well, what 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 the other what what the industry was trying to say is that this policy was preempted because the state law said you couldn't go beyond twenty one, and the court disagreed with them unanimously. Thank you, Cheryl. When your recommendation for us to ban the sale of those products. I'll call them the mouth products um, that that are nicotine. Wouldn't they fall under the, the nicotine free generation policy as well? Oh yeah, they certainly okay. would. But this and and we're not suggesting banning them. We're saying restrict them to adult only stores okay. until we get more um, evidence on the health effects. But at least get them away from the youth that are purchasing them. These products are so popular that you cannot find them in some convenience stores because they can't manufacture them fast enough. Um, they fly off the shelves. And if you know those inspectors that we know will say, and Donna probably has seen this too, that they're taking up more and more shelf space because they're so popular. Meredith, when you were talking about the shared service agreement, if we were to um, move in the nicotine-free generation um, direction, does that sort of clear a path for the, our other sister communities to do the same? But they would also have their own boards of health in their own communities, right? They do. So they 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 have autonomy to pass their own regulation, but it is yeah. in the work plan, which is agreed amongst the 14 communities, what we're going to work on. And tobacco is one of them, um, tobacco and nicotine, because some of the 14 communities that are part of our shared service agreement are not part of the Pioneer Valley Tobacco Collaborative where they get constant um, TA and enforcement and inspections. 
um, and education. So um, yeah, that's not a given. They again get to have the authority like you Board of Health members do to pass or not pass, amend or not amend the regulation. But there is a great synergy amongst the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. And I, I do want to um, just add to what Cheryl was saying. Either the shelves are stocked like we've never seen with these products or they can't get them. They're super, super popular. And again, they're, you know, anecdotally because it's it's too early to say, but they're popular amongst our youth because they're very discreet to use. You can use them, you know, in school, at home. You just tuck them in your cheek or, you know, in, in your lip. Um, these, these pouches do come in flavors, even though they're not supposed to sell on, they are being sold with flavors. They're perceived to be, um, when we look at risk, um, they're perceived to be safer than combustible cigarettes. So, and I think we see a lot of, you know, the sexy, uh, marketing and social media around these products as well, like we did with Juul. So it's like following the same patterns, over and over again, it's Groundhog's Day, just a new product. Oral cancers are not sexy. No, for sure. Mm -hmm. No. That's the opposite of sex. Mm -hmm. And they pack a punch. I think I remember reading, and Cheryl or Donna could probably add, I think it was one tin of just the regular um, uh, pack of Zen, not the high test milligram is equivalent to two and a half packs of combustible cigarettes. Oh, wow. No, you mean in the amount of nicotine that they have? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they create a little buzz-like effect. Sure, sure. Thank you for bringing up the um, uh, race, class, et cetera. Um, background information and that lead, leads me to we always talk about a DEI lens on a policy, um, which is something we're kind of committed to in the board. Um, is there a formal way of doing that? And has that been done um, at Brooklyn, Brookline, doing the DEI lens on a policy of this nature? Well, what 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 some um, experts have said is that this is a bit of an equity issue here because of it really locks in some existing disparities, especially with elders. Um, it 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 there's a thought that it's really um, deprioritizing smokers. Um, in that, and, and the way to combat that is to really beef up cessation resources in the municipality that's a way to um to 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 end that inequity is to make sure you have these services available and we don't have enough of them available now yeah, so that yeah. would be something that should be a priority for any municipality that is considering this to get at that that equity issue there so i can just add if you don't mind um we, I have talked to uh, uh, to our nurses, our public health nurses, about becoming certified tobacco cessationists. We used to have um, Jenny Meyer, who was that, to provide services, and now there's actually youth cessation tobacco programs. Were five years ago, those were not available. And when we talk about, I remember looking at the uh, the PNAS data that I was referring to just a few minutes ago. There was a slide on subpopulations that showed um, that LGBTQI populations, trans, non-binary, have higher rates of yeah. smoking and vaping. So we really want to be cognizant of that as well. And I think um, girls and women fell into that category of higher use. Um, Cheryl, do you or the MAHB have any recommendations on how boards of health can engage the community and, and rally support for something like this? 
the way you always have. I mean, when Meredith made the point that not only do you hold a public hearing, but you hold workshops so that there can be a dialogue. Um, that's a really important piece. I mean, even though there's no legal requirement that anyone hold a hearing, a public hearing, how on earth can you get buy-in from your municipality if you don't? Um, and this board knows that very well and holds several hearings before enacting anything. And um, I would just continue to, 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 to utilize the best practices that you always do. Suzanne? I just want to point out something that uh, everyone already knows to keep our focus about this. Um, smoke, cigarettes, nicotine is still the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. It contributes to one out of five premature deaths or, or deaths um, in the United States still now, uh, which is about uh, 500,000 deaths a year. This is not a trivial issue. Um, smoking rates may be down, but even if adults, only 10% of adults are smoking, that's 10% of, that's 10 of every 100 people. So that's a lot of people who are affected by this. And it's costing a lot of money. Yes, oh yes. Yes, we don't even wanna talk about healthcare costs that are incurred by that. And we don't really know what the long-term health effects are of e-cigarettes and vaping. We do not. Mm -hmm. no. Dallas? Yeah, that's just what I wanted to clarify that it's, it seems like with tobacco, that that's very clear. And with nicotine delivery systems, we may not fully know either way, um, given the lack of long-term studies. Um, and kind of on that point, it, just reading through the regs, it doesn't seem like this would apply at all to nicotine cessation programs like nicotine gum. Nicotine no, juice. no, those are completely exempt. Any FDA approved cessation device is welcome. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I, I would welcome a discussion in a future meeting of, about um, the smoking cessation resources that we have. I, I'm not. I'm not clear. I know. I know individual medical providers can prescribe, and I know that there are quit lines and and there are trainers. But I don't. I don't know what what the resources are. And if we're talking about measures like this, I think we need to be real clear on what's available and what needs to be beefed up. Good point. Anybody else? Um, one question for Cheryl. Do you know if um, the state is disseminating information about nicotine-free generation policies and encouraging municipalities to participate? Or is this sort of one by one sort of whatever, whatever they happen um, to do? It's, it's it's one by one now, but they are working on putting together some sort of a toolkit. Um, their concern, which I share, is that we can't look at this as a silver bullet. This does not solve the tobacco problem that we have, the epidemic that we have. And that's their, they just don't want people to, to see this as, if we pass this policy, we're done. Everything's going to be fine because three decades from now or two decades from now, no one's going to be able to smoke. No one's going to be, no one will be able to purchase tobacco. They'll still be able to smoke, obviously, but in that one specific municipality. So they want to, as I, I feel the way they do, I, I want to see this as part of a comprehensive approach. And because you have that comprehensive comprehensive approach. Um, I think DPH and, well, I, I shouldn't speak for DPH. I would be happy to support that in a city like Northampton. If we can get, if we have strong cessation 
And, you know, we think uh, we don't throw the smokers out to dry. Anyone else? I just asked, like, what, what does strong cessation look like? Are there things that are happening um, in communities that I'm not... Oh, yeah. yeah, and and I would refer you, and I I will contact her to Shirlene Jean, who specializes in cessation services at the Department of Public Health, and she can provide more information that I can as what is available. Your thought: getting more cessation counselors is really important. I mean that the quit line is great. There's also a texting line for youth, which is great, but we we don't have enough. We, we just don't have enough services out there. Um, and they're not obvious to a lot of smokers. The quit line is, but some people don't use the quit line. Or don't, that's not how, that's not the way they communicate. I'd be really interested to know what they provide in the schools. That's been a real challenge. Um, and and these are the issues that I think DPH wants us to consider and to think about and to work on. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Dallas? Yeah, I would just also be interested to know if there are any, not only information, but any smoking cessation you know, products that are also, you know, made available to people too. Um, because for so many people, you know, the hurdle may not be information, but actually being able to afford. Uh, right. And and that's something that um, the DPH is, is prioritizing now. Great. Cheryl and Janet, remember back in our, when we were flush with the tobacco money, we had yeah. a pretty strong cessation um, program programs a variety of different ones in our community so um you know i think the template's still there <laughs> but it takes resources yeah any other questions or comments well cheryl we so appreciate your coming especially in the evening not a problem it's tough to get a hold of you, but we're so glad when you get when you're here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, any last thoughts? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, I'm gonna say so long and farewell. Good night, Cheryl. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, All right. Any other um Thoughts before we leave this subject? Uh, uh, think yeah, about. Yeah. I think that would be my thought. What? How would the board like to proceed? I have not seen the what you you said you sent um, the draft regulations meshed with our old ones. I I didn't I missed that. So. Okay. I spent it two days ago. Okay. Um, I can tell you exactly. September 17th at 2.50 p.m. Okay. The draft of yeah. the merge. I know you sent us something, but I didn't know it was that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll look at I'll it read again. my emails. <laughs> <laughs> we have no other emails to read. Why would we not read that? <laughs> um, all right. So, um, Let's give everybody a chance to look at those and maybe next month um, we can actually all have them in front of us and, and go over them. Does that sound reasonable? Well, I, I mean, is what you're saying that you sent, because I did look at it, but it wasn't clear to me. Is this basically a draft that includes the tobacco free generation in it? So yeah. it would be a template for what we would be approving or not. The MFG, yeah, both. Mm -hmm. And, and then there's happens. just a few definition changes in there. Um, they did a very good job in highlighting and adding comment what came from the model regulation and has been inserted into our regulation. 
So there's dates actually in there that would apply for Northampton. Dates. Dates meaning um, if we were to pass it, that uh, it would affect young people as they become 21, you know. Okay, so we would okay. pick a date. So if we pass right. this this year, we would, I mean, we want to give uh, the public, the businesses time to acclimate and get used to the policy. So it would be sometime in 2025. So then we would actually pick that finite date for the NFG where you can and cannot purchase. So so that would be after hearings, assuming that after hearings, we wanted to go forward. Right. That's when the date would get inserted. Yes. Yeah, we wouldn't. Mm -hmm, exactly. I think and the goal is in two phases. If, if the board was comfortable and wants to move forward with restricting the nicotine delivery products, we could go ahead and have a hearing on that next month if you would like to. And while, we'll, while we do our due diligence and hold a couple public forums on the NFG, I would hate the NFG to hold up the restriction of nicotine delivery products. That Those products are everywhere. They are so strong. They come in milligrams that are beyond our wildest dreams. Um, I think 35 milligrams we've seen them up to. That's what was going around. Um, it's insanity. It's the adrenaline buzz that it's giving not only youth, but adults is, I hear quite, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, a lot. So how do we fast track that? Do we need a hearing for that? I mean, we could actually vote on that next month. Or... We could, yeah. I would, and, yes. We don't need a hearing, but it's our best practice that we always have a hearing. So I would propose that we have a hearing with that in a draft regulation and the board could vote on it. I think there are other smaller changes in there as well. I would like to separate the smoke regeneration component from everything else that's in the, the, the draft. Mm -hmm. um, I feel a lot more comfortable moving forward on that than I do about smoke regeneration at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is the proposal to um, have a, here we'll put out uh, the draft without the nicotine free generation, but with the other changes um to put out that draft and have a, a hearing related to that is that what everyone wants to do that would be before we workshop the changes um we generally spend a lot of time going over the language in the proposed change some of it is beyond our control because it's it's new language from the state so what we learned last time because we workshopped it a lot um, and we got held up a little bit on just, you know, um, wordsmithing that I remember Cheryl saying, don't let the language hold you up. It's the spirit of the strategy that we're voting on. So if we wanted to just include, you know, that one strategy and vote on that, I don't want us to get hung up and, and spend multiple months on, you know, just small language changes. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, since we haven't all even seen the draft, why don't we just review the draft next month and then following that, uh, consider going quickly to a hearing and a, and a vote for the, what we could, would consider maybe the more minor changes. Um, so I will, what I'll do is I'll clean it up, I'll take NFG out and then I'll send it to you the early, uh, beginning of next week, a clean draft without that in there. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Okay. Um, minutes. Did everyone have a chance to look at minutes? I did. I I didn't see anything worth mentioning. Um. From Kelly's beautiful draft, I removed an apostrophe. Other than that, <laughs> the, 
They were great. It was really good. Thanks, <laughs> Kelly. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> um, all right. Would um, someone like to make a, a motion to accept the minutes? Cynthia? Motion. Motion to approve. Sorry. Second. The minutes. <laughs> all right. We got Janet on the second. Um, any other discussion or comments about the minutes? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. yes. Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Dallas? Uh, I abstain. I was not there. Okay. Okay. Um, great. Thank you, everyone. Dallas, you want to uh, have the have the floor? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, as many people here know, um, if we've seen our emails, um, I just wanted to share something very bittersweet after a lot of thought and reflection. I've made the decision to resign from the Northampton Board of Health. This is obviously not an easy choice, but I'm preparing to move away from Northampton and that leaves me from remaining on the board. Um, and, you know, serving alongside everyone here since 2022 has been one of the greatest honors of my life whether it's been COVID-19, navigating through MPOX, addressing many other public health needs, I'm going to always carry these moments with me. And I'm so inspired by everyone here uh, who has met each of these challenges with a sense of purpose, resilience, and above all, a deep care for the people that we serve. So I wanted to really express my gratitude to everyone here today for your unwavering dedication to the health and safety of Northampton. It's really been a source of strength and inspiration and you've shown me that the true measure of leadership is not in easy decisions, but in how we respond when we're faced with very hard ones. Um, and specifically, uh, Dr. Levin and Meredith, your leadership has really been nothing short of exemplary. And so thank you for really guiding us through these tough times in public health. I could not have asked for better partners and I'm so proud of what we've all accomplished together. And so though I'm stepping down today, I'm doing so with such immense pride in the work that we've done, the progress that we've made, and I'm leaving with full confidence that this board will continue to lead Northampton's public health efforts with the same strength, vision, uh, dedication uh, that have always defined it. It's really been an honor and a privilege to be able to serve alongside all of you. And um, while I may no longer formal, be a formal member of the board, I'll always carry the spirit of this work with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. And thank you for your work in the community. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you. Dallas, your input, your guidance, you know, through the last two years has been instrumental. Um, it's been an honor to have you on the board and to have your perspective and insight and just your time and patience with me and, you know, just treating me as your colleague and friend and I have nothing but big love for you and the work that you do. You've brought just so much to our community. It's gonna be sorely missed. I wish you the best wherever you're going and I hope you can serve in a similar way that you served us here in Northampton. Thank I think you. you provided breakthrough leadership for us on the board and in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, now someone else will benefit from that. And I wish you the very, very best. I totally agree. Your your input on the board and your guidance um, and community service have been unbelievable and so important and so influential and uh, really has um, been very meaningful, I think, for all of us. So we really, really appreciate uh, all of you done. Thank you. And being the newest member on the board, <laughs> it's not fair because I didn't have a chance to work with you. <laughs> long enough <laughs> well I'm, I'm i'm i will be in boston for a little bit i will just be right down the road um <laughs> you know you all have my contact info and please don't be a stranger too all right well thank you so much just words can't really express you know i think what we all feel thank you and thank you all Anybody else?
you didn't forget about old business, right? Oh, was it not on the agenda? It's supposed to be it's on there. the agenda. <laughs> Sorry, Janet, you're up. Okay. Um, well, we still have the ordinance of the shield law um, that we talk been talking about kind of on and off for, I believe, well over a year now. And um, just to be as concise as possible, we had sent a letter of support to uh, Rachel Maori and um, Councillor Jarrett in, I think, around March of 2024. My understanding is that the full um, city council did not see it, has not seen it yet, because um, based on our input and the input of attorney Seewald, um, the, the ordinance was revised and it omitted anything to do with the crisis pregnancy centers. Um, and then um, Councilor Maori asked again about it and attorney Sewell then said, and I think I have my time frame right, but that there were still two issues um, having to do with, with Northampton's charter that attorney Seawald said prohibits the city council from passing the ordinance of the shield law. And um, he gave, uh, and I have uh, Councilor Maori forwarded to me the two links in the charter that he um, was referring to that basically um, say, that, give me a second here, that prohibits a council from exercising what's considered an executive function and prohibiting the council from giving orders or directives to executive employees. And so it's based, so his suggestion was that a resolution gets passed instead, um, possibly that the mayor could put a policy together. Um, and it, it, then the resolution acts as a de facto policy. You can tell I'm a lawyer uh, <laughs> in the way I talk. And, uh, and, or possibly that it's the Board of Health that passes the policy. And, and I'm still very unclear, you know, does it need to be versus a policy or what, but this basically, the shield law, it was, I think, Brookline that did pass something like this. Um, several other communities have, but they did it as an ordinance. I mean, I'm sorry, as a bylaw. So at this point, when I spoke with Rachel Maori last week, she still didn't feel like she had real clarity about, you know, why why as a municipal law, this is an issue when the Massachusetts Supreme Court has already backed up the city of Brookline and, and, and others and have said that as a bylaw, which goes through the attorney general, that it's fine. She said that she was going to contact you, um, Meredith, to see if you and her could possibly meet with the mayor um, and figure out who could submit this as an ordinance so that we can codify this law that the that Massachusetts has already put together. So that's where it stands, which is basically that we're still waiting. So I did help with the language and the writing of it. Um, we had a little subcommittee that she asked me to sit in on. And one of the concerns was that it in it has been a while. I can barely remember what I ate for breakfast. So um, when I say this, just take it for a grain of salt there. It did identify responsibilities of certain departments to act if there was a violation of it. And that's where the issue was. Um, so we thought about taking that out and then just making um, that a, a city policy and then it could pass the muster for attorney Seawall. Um, so I'm not sure where that's at, but I'm happy to connect with Councillor Maori 
to help move it along. I don't see why it couldn't be a regulation if they think it's going to be held up. Um, a regulation of the Board of Health. Right, right. And we don't have the same constraints on us? No, we don't. I mean, we can't, right, no, we can't ask the human resource department, or we can't make it a policy of the regulation requesting that the human resource department provide some type of orientation on the shield law, but we can work as a municipality to do that, but it just can't be written into the regulation. Is there any understanding of whether the mayor would take advantage of the opportunity that she has to, um, as leader of the executive branch, to implement this that way? If it gets implemented that way, then when there's a new mayor, they don't have to follow it? Probably. I, don't you still need, like, you mean ordinance way, Suzanne? No, um, I understood when Janet was talking about um, about there being an option for the mayor to act on this. And yeah. I wasn't clear about the details, but that's what I was reflecting on, what Janet talked about, one of the options. Mm -hmm. So Rachel's last note said that she was hoping to connect with you, Meredith, like, I mean, she said this last week that, and that's why I didn't know if she had or not connected with you before tonight, but that she um, now wants to see if we can meet with the mayor and get this submitted by one of us is what she said. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's a discussion with, with the mayor and Councilor Mayori at this point and you. And attorney <laughs> who understands this more than anybody, I guess. Yeah. But if it's at the will of the mayor, it can just be a city policy where it wouldn't need um, legal advice from attorney Seawald, which it should be a city policy in part of, you know, HR orientation for all new employees. But so I think that's not a heavy lift. So, I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll connect with her, Janet. Mm -hmm. Great. She did um, also mention that I guess they have a council meeting tonight that she was going to be introducing a resolution declaring Northampton a sanctuary city for transgender and gender non-conforming people. Um, and, and that resolution will advocate for protecting gender affirming healthcare data at the municipal level. So it's related, but it's not the same thing. And so I, I just wanted to pass that on since I told her I would give this update. Great, thank you. It sounds like we're in sort of legal limbo. And do you have any idea how that resolution that's going to council tonight, um, what that does for the ordinance that we have seen i mean they, it's the ordinance has much more detail in it right um yeah i she I just say more than that to me i just pulled it up well what they're discussing tonight in that resolution and i just happened to know because my counselor worked with rachel maori on this resolution and they really the two of them as i was told on a walk, they banged it out in like four hours. And then it came, I mean, I'm talking about this past week. And then it's going to city council tonight for its first read. So, um, you know, it's another avenue. I'm, I'm just saying. But, it, but it's a resolution. It's not an yeah, ordinance. I understand. Because <laughs> Attorney Thewald <laughs> was suggesting that we do some kind of, yeah. or that the city council does a resolution as well. Um, for the sh for the shield law, but you know, yeah, it, it has no teeth, right? You know, as a resolution, exactly, right? Yeah. So Meredith, um, if you meet with uh, Council Mayori and Attorney Seawold um, and figure out where that should live. Uh, okay. 
Let us know. <laughs> I'll meet with Councilor Mayori. I know Attorney Seawald leaves for vacation for a couple of weeks starting tomorrow. So, but yep, yeah, I'll keep you posted. Great. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Just, just a real quick one. This lighting thing that one of the public mm -hmm. commenters brought up seems to be a big thing. I don't know if it's something we should be addressing or not, but she reached that individual reached out and wanted to partner with us. So I'm not sure how that's all done. So just I, I don't me. know either. And and I guess they wanted to partner with us in giving a talk. And I don't know what partnering with us means. And I also don't know the content of their talk. Um, I remember that this was an issue was brought to the board years ago. There yep. was a professor from Smith yep. who had a particular interest in this and um, had a particular request of the, the mayor at that time, Mayor Narkowitz, about uh, changing out the streetlights. And the mayor reported that they had changed out the streetlights and were in the process of doing that. And they were the most up-to-date shielded um, streetlights that were possible. So that's the last time I remember discussing that with the board. So I'm not sure what we can do about lighting on private property. That sounds like um, the type of uh, uh, direction that was being advocated. So I think city council did approve, I think what the timing of the professor's um, request didn't work out too well because the city had already purchased their lighting right. and he right. wanted even, you know, better than that, but it, it had already been purchased and and all that. But I think the city did did um, write something that um, consideration of, of um, light would happen to have to happen for future projects. Um, but the requests we had tonight uh, were for partnering for educating the public. Um, I don't know what that means. Meredith, do you have thoughts about that? I mean, does that mean that they can hold a meeting in the in the city space and then we can advertise it or they can use our name? Us to be a co-sponsor of it, which I would um, advise the board not to at this point until we have more information. Everything that we do, ha you know, has sound, um, is evidence-based, scientific. There's something that we can sink our teeth into um, and I just, I don't know enough about this to even speak to it. Um, so I think we need to be informed more before we sponsor anything. Um, and, um, if I can, if I can add this, um, I looked into it a little bit, a little while back and what they did put in place is any, any new building had to meet what the city was asking, but certainly if there was a light outside my window that was bothering me, I could uh, reach out to the zoning board and they would take it like a complaint. They would go out and measure, measure the lumens and see if they met the ordinance. And if they did not at that point, they might have to upgrade and, and change to meet it. I think that's, that's how I understand it. And that's not educating, but that's how it's being dealt with. So is there an actual zoning law regarding uh, the lumens of, of private properties, outdoor lighting? It, it, I believe, I don't know if I want, I want, I think it's an ordinance, Meredith. And that came out earlier, like a springtime. I thought that had more to do with municipal property though. I don't believe so. Again, I'd have to review it. I read it quick earlier in the summer. Interesting. So mm. is there, I just look back on my notes. It seemed like she, uh, one of the individuals was requesting a meeting. Um, so is there a protocol for how that might happen? Absolutely. If the board would like to hear more information instead of just the two minute public comment, we can invite her to a future board of health meeting to speak and where we can put it under the discussion part of the agenda. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that the way where we might get the data that, you know, we don't have right now? It would be an introduction to it. Mm -hmm. 
think uh, the professor that's sort of spearheading this from Smith is James Lowenthal. Um, and he was the one that came to us before. Mm -hmm. um, so he's a he's quite a large advocate for this. So he may be the one that has um, some science behind. But um, I don't know him personally, but it's it's become an issue in my community. So he's been involved there. So I guess um, I don't know these uh, people who wanted to give um, community education, but I would want Professor Lowenthal to sort of approve the message in a, in, you know, in, in a way, since we don't have expertise in that, because um, I don't know what, you know, what would be said, and I want to make sure that it is conforms with the science. We could ask him if he would want to get involved. Does that make sense? I can see the advantage of approaching this on, in a targeted way rather than a broad public education campaign because it's just specific locations where people believe that it is affecting them or is a nuisance in some way. Um, and a broad message would probably get lost uh, on the people in the places that really need to be looked at. The message I got before the meeting was that they wanted to give a talk and wanted us to sort of co-sponsor it. Um, so it wouldn't be a broad message per se, rather than a, a, a a talk where the community is invited. Well, that would be an endorsement from us. Mm -hmm. If it were, if we were working with them as a member of the board, that would be an endorsement of some kind. I do think to Meredith's point, and I'm really out of my lane here, but this is what's called the Dark Side, Dark Skies Initiative. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is focused on um the environmental impact of <clears throat> diminishing stars. And so, and again, I'm out of my lane here. So connecting that to one's health is what, you know, that's the challenge, I think, for us. And so it would, for me, I think I would like to hear from Professor Lowenthal if we went in that direction. Um, there's some stuff out there about how it affects health, but I just don't know how strong it is. Um, is Kelly still on? So Kelly, um, if you could remind me of the contact information, you can send me by email um, for that woman who wanted to meet or one of the women who, who spoke tonight, I can give them a call and get more information about that. Okay. I'm, I'm just looking back on um, my notes that I took during it. And one of them um, spoke about increase in breast cancer rates and autoimmune diseases. And so um, that's where it resonated with me as this is health data, but of course that's where we'd want to see the science that, how do we know this? So I think you know, let's start, let's get some of the, the real facts down first, if we can, from people who, whether it's the professor at Smith or others have the data and where did they get it? Okay, I can do a little investigating and talk to Professor Lumenthal. I know he would love it if uh, we got involved. <laughs> so, okay, um, anything else? I just else? ask, is there, is there any update on the ventilation? Oh, yes, because there. that was on the agenda. I'm um, curious. Ventilation Task Force is alive and well. We're meeting on a regular basis. Um, we've uh, given several small grants to some small, we did not have a big response from the restaurant community, despite multiple attempts to contact them. Um, we have given, um, I think, three or four small grants to smaller rest for to smaller restaurants who uh, needed portable HEPA filters. Just um, um, and um, there is one uh, large concert venue that is doing a significant upgrade to their ventilation, and we are giving them a larger grant. Our original grant said we could give up to $1,000, but since we didn't have a lot of people apply, uh, we got permission to give up to $10,000, which is um, 
which we're planning on, we're, we've granted to one of these concert venues uh, to really upgrade their, their ventilation system to use MERV-13, which is uh, what's recommended um, for respiratory protection. So, um, and now we're uh, coming up with a round two since we have money left. Um, and so round two, um, originally the request was for uh, places where one could not easily mask. So daycare centers, um, gyms and spas. Um, but on further reflection, we thought uh, we wanted to include places where vulnerable populations receive services. Um, some of the homeless shelters and other, other places. Um, so we're going to include those places in round two and sort of prioritize the, those um, locations over the spas and gyms. Um, we're still going to include uh, the daycare centers as a higher priority. Um, and we're sort of in the process of formulating our um, round two um, announcement. Amy, do you have anything else to add? Amy's been our, Amy and her staff have been working very hard on this, making sure everybody knows everything that's happening and clearing things with the city uh, ARPA um, leaders. So um, making sure we're all on the up and up and doing everything right. We yeah, got no, that's, that's it. That's, yeah. that covers it all. We got yeah. a community person on, um, on our committee, which I was very excited about, uh, Devin Bruce, and she's, um, really been great um anything else can i just ask you you might have said it and i might have missed it is there a deadline where this money has to be distributed it is everything completely wrapped up by june 30th 2026 oh okay oh yeah <laughs> okay that's good we'll have it wrapped up way before right. it. <laughs> anything else all right, our next meeting is um, October 17th. Is there anybody who knows they are not gonna be able to come? I'm gonna be out of town, but I am going to um, take the meeting from where I where I will be that evening. Great, thank you. Anybody I will, else? I will obviously not be there. <laughs> I'll miss you all. And it's the same with me. I won't be in town, but I'm hoping to be able to zoom in. Okay. If things change, let us know, because um, then we would not have a quorum. And um, Meredith, uh, have you met with the mayor to talk about a new board member? I've met with the mayor. Um, uh, she had received Dallas's um, letter of resignation. Um, we talked about it a little bit. Um, you know, we will have this open seat. We, she said she would look at um, letters of interest to all different boards to see if there's anyone out there that wasn't selected to serve on a board or a commission that might um, want to serve on this. Board. We talked about diversity, um, what it is there, who it is that we'd like to serve on this board. We'd like someone, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe a male, maybe a person of color, maybe someone in business, non-medical, you know, something to look a little different than the makeup of our board right now. Um, so she's going to ask one of her um, assistants in the mayor's office to look at existing. And then of course she will put it on the city's website that we have an open seat. And we spent some, a great deal of time. I wanna say a couple years ago, um, right before you got on the board Dallas and updating our um, board of health member opportunity to make sure that it was really inclusive because the way it was worded before it was exclusive and people thought they needed a medical background to sit on the board. So we did a lot of work with CES on that job description. So I'll look at that one more time before we, we post it. 
Will will we still need three for a quorum in the meantime? Yes. Okay, so if you find that you're not going to be able to make the meeting, please let uh, Meredith and I know. Um, anybody else? Anything else? Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Dallas. And uh, good luck in your future, wherever that may bring you. Thank you. Thanks, good night, everybody. We need a motion to close. Oops. Move to close. <laughs> Back in. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Dallas. Aye. <laughs> Cynthia. Yes. Janet. Yes. Suzanne. Yes. Joanne. Yes. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>